if you're taking note, the title to the message is The Philistines and the Ark. We're going to see the enemies of God having really the representation of the presence of God, the throne of God in the center of their lives, in the center of their, of their worship. We're going to see the altar of Dagon. And uh, man, it's an exciting thing. Uh, for you note takers, 1 Samuel chapter 5 and really the whole beginning of 1 Samuel, you know, it's still the, the setting of Israel is still the time of the judges. Uh, if you were with us in the time of the judges, you know, as we studied the book of Judges, the phrase that went over and over in the book of Judges was, and they all did, you know, everyone did what was, remember, what was right in their own eyes. And we're still kind of in that season. Remember, even when God begins to move, even when God begins to change a nation or a church or a community, there's kind of that transition period. And that's what we're in. The first Samuel is, we're still in the time of the judges. Most scholars believe even first Samuel chapter five, if you're with us in the book of Judges, is, is that period of time when Samson ties the, uh, the torches to the tails of those foxes and has them go through the fields. This is kind of that overlap. God is beginning to move. And usually when God begins to move, God's people, it takes them a little time to catch on. You know, it takes a little time for the fire to warm up the room, to warm up the people, for the temperatures in their hearts to change. And he's doing it, you know, specifically through this man as we've looked at God raised up this man, Samuel. Now, chapter five, we're going to look at tonight. We're going to see and we're kind of diving in. Chapter 4, we saw the, the children of Israel went to battle. The ark was taken during battle. They were, they were defeated. And there was a loss of life, a tremendous loss of life. But even more than that, the ark of the covenant was taken into the Philistines' camp. And Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they all died. Eli's daughter-in-law, she died as well during childbirth. And she named the child, remember, Ichabod, which means the glory has departed. They believe that... As the ark was taken, so God had left them. And we looked at that on Sunday. Guys, listen, if you, left, if you didn't leave with that on Sunday, then you weren't listening. God will never leave you and he will never forsake you. You know, Eli lost his life. His, his daughter-in-law lost her life. Her heart failed because she believed that with the, the losing of the ark of the covenant, she lost the Lord. And it's really not true. It's just not true. The Lord will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And now the ark, this representation of the presence of God, this representation of the throne of God is in the hands of the Philistines. And they thought that God had left them. That, that's where we're picking up chapter five. It, it, the nation of Israel feels like God's left them. Samuel knows God hasn't left them. He's hearing from the Lord. He submitted to the Lord. Remember, speak, Lord, your servant hears. He's in a position of submission, a position of a servant. He's listening. But you know, as we dive in, guys, listen, how can people get to the place where they think God has left them? I always think of it with this illustration. It's that of a bent antenna, right? You know, you ever gotten a bent antenna on your car? Maybe you have a radio at home. The antenna breaks off and now your reception, you just don't get it the same anymore. It, it doesn't pick up the, the, you know, the signal as well. The signal's still there. But your antenna is bent. And really, that's what repentance is. It's just straightening it out, right? Getting it back to where it needs to be. And for the children of Israel, I really believe as we move into this text, and I hope you guys are catching this. You know, I know some in the church today say the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. But I don't think they're studying their Bibles. Because I really think if you're taking it, you could jot it down. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. This is a verse I would recommend everyone memorizes. It's there, Paul the Apostle says to Timothy, his protege, he says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. You see, God is so attached to himself here back in the old, this is a New Testament verse, but it certainly applies to what we're studying here tonight. God is so attached himself to the children of Israel that even in their weakness, even when they are losing their life, they believe it so strongly that God has left them God has not left them. And we're going to see that tonight, a picture of that uh, in this Old Testament text. So 1 Samuel chapter 5, we're going to see this. Let's pick it up, verse 1. It says, then the Philistines took the ark of God. 
Remember, Israel had been defeated in battle. Now the ark of God has been taken. And what are they going to do with it? It says, and they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Verse 2, when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon, and they set it by Dagon. Now, if you're taking note, the first thing we're going to see here in the text in terms of, you know, just the Philistines and the Ark of God, what happens? This representation of God, uh, of his throne, is brought into the temple of the Philistines' god, Dagon. And the first thing I want you to see is, here is that God humiliates his enemies in victory. God humiliates his enemies in victory. You might be here going, Pastor, you're being mean. You're saying mean things about God. He doesn't humiliate his enemies. Let me tell you it again. God humiliates his enemies in victory, and I'm not ashamed to say that. It's not wrong of him. You know, um, I grew up playing baseball, and baseball is kind of like a respectful game. It's, it's, a, it's a unique thing. You know, you might watch it or have played baseball with friends or softball or wiffle ball or something, but when you actually play baseball regularly, it is, a, it is a game built on respect. And there's kind of an unwritten rule. It's not in the books. It's not in the rule book. But it's an unwritten rule that if you are like really beating another team, it's just your day. You're up by 10 runs. You're just, everything is working. The unwritten rule is that after you're up by 10 runs, you're not going to steal bases anymore. You're not going to, you know, really run up the score. You're not going to disrespect your opponent. And I'll tell you, the higher up you get in baseball, when you're playing an opponent, and maybe it's their day and not yours, and if they start running up the score, there's consequences for that. You know, that's when you see a pitcher, the ball gets loose and goes at the batter's head type of thing. That's part of baseball. It's part of the rules. It's part of the unwritten rules of the game. But that's a game. Guys, in God's economy, in the kingdom of God, God humiliates his enemies in victory. If you're taking note, jot this verse down, Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. This is referring once again, and, and I'm trying to, you know, it's on my heart because doctrinally in the church today, there's this idea that we need to do away with the Old Testament because the God of the Old Testament really misrepresents the God of the New Testament. Not only is that elementary foolishness, but it's not, it's, it's not even a good thing. It's not true. Colossians 2, verse 15, Paul says this, speaking of Jesus and what happened on the cross, I'll actually start in verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. So Jesus on the cross wiped out all the law, all the requirements, verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Guys, listen, Jesus doesn't win. The God of the Bible doesn't win. He humiliates his enemies in victory. If you would let God really have his way in your life, you will see this happen. You won't just win. You will humiliate your enemies in victory. The enemies of God. He will give you, the, the Bible doesn't call us conquerors. Paul said what? We're, we're more than conquerors. Guys, we don't win by 10 runs. It's a million to, to, to nothing. God gives us victory. And we see that in the text here. You know, the, 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 the Philistines, they bring the Ark of the Covenant now into the temple. Uh, they go into this city. It's called Ashdod. It's one of the five Philistine cities that was located on the, the Mediterranean Sea in southern Israel. And they, it says they set it by Dagon. Now, Dagon, he's kind of like a, you know, a man mermaid. Um, he's half fish, half man. Um, they actually believe that he was the the father of Baal. Baal was a serious God in those days. And when we talk about these foreign gods or these gods of the Old Testament, um, you have to understand how significant they were to the people. You know, when they went into battle, the idea was that if my God is greater than your God, then I'll win. If your God is greater than my God, then I'll win. And, and really, the idea that things today are so different than they were back then is just fallacy and it's foolishness. It's exactly how it works today. If what, you know, one person says, well, I live for money and I'm going to win because I live for money. Well, they called that God in the Old Testament mammon, right? Well, I live for sex. I live to please myself sexually. Well, that God was called Aphrodite. Well, I live for power 
in authority. Well, that God was called Baal. These, uh, you know, I live for alcohol. That God was called Bacchus. We, we, we think we're so advanced today, but we're really not. It's the same. But Baal was a powerful God. He was one of the main deities of the Philistines. And the Philistines, they were confident that their God was greater than Israel's God. Because why? Because they had just defeated Israel in battle. Meanwhile, God had a plan that Israel didn't fully understand, that certainly the Philistines had no idea. And can I say this, church? Listen, the key to life is finding the right master. It's the key. The key to life is finding the right master. It's submitting yourself to the right master. You know, the person who says, well, I'm not ruled by anything or anyone, and those religious people, they're, they're bound to their religion. It, it's just not true. Everyone in life is serving someone. It could be yourself. It could be, you know, could be, as we said before, money, these different things. But the key to life is finding the right master. And can I say, it's even finding the strongest master, the one that will win the battles. And it is the Lord. And they thought, the Philistines thought this was proved the, the fact that they defeated Israel, that it was proof that Dagon was the strongest. Well, God's going to handle that. You'll see here in a moment. Verse 3, it says, uh, so, so now the Ark of the Covenant is in Dagon's temple. It's beside Dagon. Verse 3, and when the people of Ashdod, they arose early in the morning, and there was Dagon, fallen on its face to the earth before the Ark of the Lord. So look what they did with their God. So they took Dagon and set it, in its place again. Now, I love this. You know, you can't make this stuff up. This is awesome. You know, you put the Ark of the Covenant. They think they defeated it. They go in and, you know, the first time, and we'll see in a moment, they could have, you know, people like to do this. When a legitimate miracle happens or God shows himself, you ever been with people, they're trying to explain it away? Well, you know, I might have left the window open there in Dagon's temple and it was a little windy last night. Anything could have happened. You know, I forgot to put the, you know, the shimmy under Dagon's left side there, and he might have, you know, tripped over himself, right? You ever seen that? I've seen it so many times. And it's interesting. Dagon falls on his face, it says, before the Ark of the, of the Lord. So he didn't just fall over. It's not like Dagon fell backwards or sideways. Dagon fell face forward. There's the Ark of the Lord. Imagine, imagine being the Philistines. You walk into your God's temple, and there's your God bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant, to the God of the Bible. You think they would change, right? Their hearts would soften. They would get it. I hear you guys often say to me, man, if so-and-so doesn't see the Lord now, and you're going to see, you know, don't, don't ever miss the extremity that man will go to to resist God. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like if man has any chance to harden their heart and say, oh, it's not the Lord, they're probably going to do that. And uh, don't sleep on that. Now I want you to remember back in the previous chapter, remember that uh, Eli's daughter-in-law, she said and she called her son's name Ichabod, the glorious departed. But I want to ask you, has the glory departed? God's still moving. Who, who's involved in this move of God? Who's helping God along in the process, right? Do, do you see this? God's doing it all by himself. You know, we saw it a few chapters earlier. We looked at Eli, and I hear this in the church today. You know, well, the, the reason why God can't move is because the pastors or the church leaders and there's apostasy and all this stuff. Listen, God saw Eli and his sons were corrupt, so what did he do? He raised up Samuel. He already had Samuel in the works. Remember, Hannah was there praying, and Eli thought Samuel was, uh, Hannah was drunk. God was already moving. He already foresaw all this. Guys, don't believe it's 2018 and the Lord's left the Ichabod on the church. I hear this, this spirit. Like, oh, nothing could happen. The church is so broken. It's, it's not the right spirit. Listen, if no one was doing anything, God would still be moving. Still be moving. Remember Jesus said, if you don't worship me, man, the rocks will cry out. He's fine. The glory had not departed. God was still working, and God was able to glorify himself before the Philistines and their pagan gods, even though his own people weren't. He could still do it all by himself. Don't sleep on the Lord. You know, his ability, his power. 
So Dagon falls. He's face down before the Lord, you know, the presence of the Lord, the, uh, the Ark of the, the Covenant. Verse 4, and it says, And when they arose early the next morning, so remember, they go in, they prop Dagon up. Now the next morning, they wake up early. You know, there was Dagon falling on his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So now once again, he's fallen prostrate before the Ark of the Covenant. But this time the Lord says, you didn't get it the first time? I'm going to make sure you know it's not a coincidence the second time. It says the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Verse 5, therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this, 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 this day. Now this is intriguing to me. If you're taking note, it's number two. Just something we can glean uh, in this area of scripture. Number two is in your own life, bring in the presence of God. Like if you want to experience victory, if you want to watch God do powerful things, you know, start, start cutting off the religious stuff the gods and the boxes, the programs, and start just bringing in the Lord. Just just let the Lord come in. I've been saying this a lot lately. You know, don't let the enemy turn reading your Bible and prayer and coming to church into a religious activity. That's the oldest trick in the book. That's what he did to Eve in the book of Genesis. He turned her relationship with God into a right and wrong. This happens. There'll be times, there'll be people in our own church that'll come to me, pastor, when you said this, that was wrong. When you did this, it was wrong. And I'm going, ah. And then I try to tell them. I always try to say the same thing. Listen, I'm sorry, but I love you. I care about you. I pray for you regularly. You see, the enemy's constantly trying to bring our, our, our experience with God into a religious experience. And what does a religious experience look like? This is what it looks like. It looks like a list of right and wrong. That's what it looks like. It looks like, well, if you, remember what Satan, the, the serpent said to Eve? He said, did the Lord indeed say? He was basically trying to say, I'm more religious than you. And I think you're off in terms of your interpretation of that verse and the wording. You, you know where Eve made a mistake? By entertaining it. You know, that's why I try to warn you folks about gossip. The Bible is very clear on these things. Why? Because when you entertain it, you enter categorically into this, well, no, I'm more religious than you. And then they go, no, I'm more religious than you. And now you're in trouble, both of you. You know, that person was already in trouble. Now you're in trouble too. Because you're saying, no, I'm better. No, I'm better. And she's going, both you guys are dirty, rotten sinners, first of all, <laughs> you know. Uh, let me remind you about the blood and the massacre of my son on the cross just to get you in the door. You know, it's amazing. But where we get in trouble is when we entertain it, even the first question. Jesus, when the, when the, when the Pharisees talked to him, you know what he would do? He would ask them a question. So they would ask him a question to draw him into their little religious Pharisee world. And what would Jesus do? He would ask them a question not to be smarter than them, but he was trying to draw them into the kingdom of God. He was trying to draw them out of the letter into the spirit, the spirit of the law, where life is. You have to catch that, church. You know, here we see the second time Dagon now has fallen flat before the Ark of the Covenant, the, the representation of God's presence on earth, the, of the throne of God. I think God had to do it twice just so that the Philistines would know this was not a coincidence. This is not a coincidence. This is the God of heaven and earth <laughs> showing you that he is Lord of all, that he's the strongest, that he's the right master, that he's the creator, that there wasn't a board meeting when the heavens and the earth were created, but there was one that was God. And this is the truth. In the head of Dagon, in both the palms of his hands, we see here are broken off. Isn't that awesome? His head and his hands are gone. That means he's got no more ability to think. And if you thought he was going to work for you, he doesn't have any hands anymore. And imagine the horror that had to come over the Philistines. You got to get, don't forget the, the picture, the context. What just happened? They just defeated Israel. They were afraid. 
Remember, they, were, they remembered amongst themselves. Remember how God delivered them from Egypt? They defeated Pharaoh. And then there was like the general there who says, act like men. And they got this great victory. Not only did they get the victory, they got their God. Now their God is in our temple and we're twice as strong now. We've got our God and their God. Not understanding there's only one God and he's about to show you that. They clearly saw the superior of the God of Israel But understand this, guys, listen, and I believe this. I believe that God brings every single human being to this place at some point in their life. To a place where they know there is a God and he is knowable. And at that moment, there's a choice to be made. The Philistines, the leaders, those that knew what happened, that knew what happened, there was a choice to be made. And the choice was to turn from their weak God and turn to the true and living God who had just shown himself to them without the the hands of any man. Without the hands of any man. He did it all by himself. You know, just like they would say about the disciples, a skeptic would say, well, probably what happened was a few of the Israelites snuck in the camp at night and they tipped him over. Man, they will explain anything away. They say the disciples stole the body of Jesus from the Roman, you know, soldiers. Yeah, that's like you and I picked 70, 11 of you guys here tonight. And we go to the Pentagon and we steal the the nuclear launch codes. How would we do? We would all be dead. That's what we would do. You know, we'd be dead or in prison for life, right? It's silly. But that's what what they say in the, the institutions of higher learning. But the choice was to turn from their weak God and turn to Jehovah God. Or what they could do is they could make a religious tradition. What did they do? They made a religious tradition. What they do is they said, now they no longer walk on the threshold of Dagon. Why? Because it had to do with the threshold of Dagon. That's why Dagon fell over. It wasn't Jehovah. I've seen this, church. I've seen people get healed of things. I've seen people go from humbled and sick to healed and prideful, no longer usable. Doing it themselves. Getting their God in the box, putting them in their bag, going and doing everything and saying, Lord, if you want to be a part, you can be a part. I'm telling you, you have a choice. Even as children of God, we have a choice. And, and, and I believe here, this is the key to being free from sin. We see it here. I believe it's here. This is the key. This is what we're going to talk about a lot on Sunday. But a little, little like, you know, little free sample here tonight. You know, there's people, they try so many programs, counseling, nothing works. Matthew chapter 5, verse 25 through 30 tells us of, a, of an account where a woman had a flow of blood for all these years. The Bible says she had gone to many doctors. And in Mark, it says the doctors actually made her worse. Things don't change. Often that's the case in our world today. We go to the doctors for our our mind problems, our soul problems, and people get worse. Why? Because we're we're to go to the Lord for our mind and our soul problems. He's the great physician. But what happens, she did that. She exhausted all her resources. But then she heard about this Jesus, and she got it in her mind if she could just get to Jesus, the actual person of Jesus. Now, I want you to note this. She didn't look for a group that had an idea about Jesus that was kind of on the fringe and maybe new, and they were going to get together and talk about it. That's not what she did. She got it in her mind, if I could get to the person of Jesus, if I can have a real relationship with Jesus and get to him and touch him, and he touches me, I wonder if he could make me well. No, that's what the Bible says happened. She touches him, and she was healed. She was healed. Church, listen. Dagon could not stand in the presence of the Lord. Dagon could not stand in the presence of the Lord. When, when you see somebody that falls radically into sin or they just get off, it's, it doesn't start that day. It started in their relationship with him. Somewhere along the line, they took Jesus out from being their savior, the one that, listen, all by himself will get glory to his name. And will reach people. And they, they go from the place of like humility and submission to the Lord to, you know, they give them the honey, I shrunk the pill zap thing. You know, honey, I shrunk the kids thing. Honey, I shrunk the pill. I don't know what that even is. 
And they put them in their little box and they put them in their pocket. Hey, Jesus, come with me today. And all of a sudden we go, what happened to that guy? What are they doing? They're kind of weird. <laughs> it's, that's, that's what happened right there. They went from an attitude of awe and wonder and the fear of the Lord. And God, I'm your servant. Anything you could do through my life, wow, it would be amazing. To, whew, Lord, you got me now to carry you around. What a blessing it is for you, huh? <laughs> you don't know the secret? That's not Jesus. <laughs> That's not Jesus. He's still the same God. You see, Dagon cannot stand in the presence of the Lord. And if you try in your own power, you'll fall over, over and over again. But if you bring in the ark of the God, if you spend time in his word, in his presence, in prayer, in fellowship, what you'll see, the light will get turned on and Dagon will fall. I don't believe in any other system of seeing sin broken in people's lives. I don't believe in any other. And I've put my money in where my mouth is. If you've been in this church for any length of time, you know how many of those programs I've said thanks, but no thanks. Because I've seen it work. It's worked in my life. It's worked in so many. Just knowing Jesus. I believe the greatest challenge to the church today is what Paul said to, to, to the Corinthians when he said, I fear just as Satan deceived Eve, so he has deceived you from the simplicity that is in Jesus. Because if you go to all those other things and you don't go to Jesus, nothing will happen. And if you go to all those other things and you go to Jesus, often what happens there is all those things get the glory. And really the only one that's doing anything is Jesus. And you're just not catching it. You're just thinking it's other things too. No, nope, it's just Jesus working, healing as he always has. But let's move on. So Dagon now is dead, right? <laughs> the Israelites had nothing to do with it. Verse 6, it says, But, so God wasn't through with the Philistines just yet, but the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod. Catch this, guys. If you don't think God has a sense of humor, wait till you see this. It says, And he ravaged them and struck them with tumors. We'll come back to that in a minute. But Ashdod, and it's uh, both Ashdod and its territory. If you're taking note tonight, number three in the text that we're gleaning from the text, number three is rest comes from obeying the Lord. If you want to be able to rest, if you want to be able to sit down in peace and rest, it comes from obe obeying the Lord, obeying the Lord. Now it says here, the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of the Philistines. Guys, you got to get it and understand this in the lives of the people around you, your family, those that you want to reach with the gospel, even in your own heart that part of you that you're still wrestling with, your flesh. Understand this. God uses circumstances to humble us. For the Philistines, they thought they had victory. They thought their God was more powerful. They bring in the Ark of the Covenant without anyone's help. Now their God is destroyed. But rather than repent and turn to the living God, they create a religious tradition. So now the Lord, he's going to keep pursuing them. And honestly, when God pursues us and we're in a position of disobedience, that pursuing doesn't look like blessing. It looks like discipline. That's just how God works. If you and I aren't doing the right thing and seeking the Lord and we're in a position of pride and, and outside the will of God and we're walking in the flesh, God's love and his pursuit of us is going to look like correction. It's going to look like him trying to tell us to turn around you're headed towards a cliff. And the reason why is because he loves us, because he cares about us. The Philistines would not listen when God struck down their statue of Dagon. They actually put it, they stood it back up again. They closed their ears. So it says here that the Lord struck them with tumors. Now, if you're taking note, you can underline the word tumors. Uh, in the King James Version, it says, it says basically emeroids. In the Greek, the Hebrew, I'm going to break this down for you just so when we get there, you guys don't think I'm lying to you. The Hebrew word is H-E-T-E-C-H-O-R. It literally means hemorrhoids, okay? So these guys needed some preparation H, to say the least. And listen, if you study the word even deeper, it's even more descriptive. There is no question <laughs> that God gave the Philistines Hemorrhoids, that's what he did. He guess it, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and you know, I jotted this down. Listen, they, if they wouldn't stand before God, 
they wouldn't be able to sit before Dagon either, okay? <laughs> they weren't going to have any rest. There was going to be no rest. Listen, listen, church, if you are praying for your son, your daughter, your friend, your neighbor, your spouse, and they're not saved yet, listen, as you pray, if they're in rebellion, God isn't going to give them rest. Now, what I see happen in the church all the time is we break into that situation and we actually, without knowing it, start fighting against God. And we try to take away the consequence that God's allowed in their life. Listen, don't help people stay prodigals. Don't help people stay in the pig pen. Jeremiah 2, God says, your own backslidings will correct you. You got to let people realize, you know, there's times where somebody may do something at church or say, oh, the Lord told me this, the Lord told me that. And sometimes people will, will ask me privately, Pastor, why didn't you take a harder stance? Two reasons. Number one, no one is mine. <laughs> They're not mine. This is not my church. This is, I believe, that what the Bible says is a fact, no matter how anyone acts, that Jesus is the head of the church, number one. Number two, listen, it'll play itself out. If it's not the Lord, <laughs> you'll know. When God sent a prophet and God spoke, do you know how many times that what God spoke didn't happen? Do you know how many? Anybody have an idea? Never. <laughs> when God sends someone to do something, it happens every time. Guarantee. It, it's the Lord. It's, a, it's how the Lord works. So these guys, they're, they're not walking in, a, you know, obedience. God has a sense of humor. Verse 7 it says, and when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, if you have your pen, underline that. We'll come back to it. They saw how it was. When the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us, and Dagon our God. Verse 8, they, they were protecting their God, you see. Therefore they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark of the God of Israel away. Now, I love this. If you're taking notice, number four, we're almost through. But number four is beware of hardening your heart. Oh, I can't, I can't press this enough. It's all there. You know, the heart of the problem is always the same. It's a problem of the heart always the same. If you're having a problem in your marriage relationship, the heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. If you're having a problem in your relationship with God, the heart of the problem is always the same. It's a problem of the heart. God is after our hearts, church. And it says the Philistines, they saw how it was. They saw how it was. They got it. The light bulb went on. You know, I, I think in the church today, and I know myself, I, I'm definitely bent like this. You know, I believe, oh man, if I could help somebody if I can help turn the light bulb on, help them like, get it, then they'll choose Jesus. Well, I've been proven wrong many times. Many. The Philistines here, they saw how it was, and what was their response? Was it to worship? Was it to yield? No, it was to say, get the ark of the God of Israel out of here. <laughs> like, it's more powerful than us. It's destroying our God. It's given us, we gotta go to the store and get preparation H. There's not enough at CVS to take care of all of us. You understand? Get him, rather than saying, we submit your God. I'm sorry. Rending their hearts, repenting. What do they do? Get this God out of here. We don't want him in our house. And I know it sounds like that's impossible, right? Who would do that? Who would be come face to face with the living God and see his power and have a lesson in the fear of the Lord and yet reject him? Church, the Bible says many will. Many will. The Philistines here do. And it's not even that, not, there's probably some of the Philistines that repent and turn to the living God at some point. We don't have a record of it, but there, I'm sure there is. But God has a plan. And there comes a point where God brings each person to a place where they see how it is. I believe that. They see how it is. Pharaoh, the Bible says, he saw these massive, just think about it. This man who basically stuttered with his brother Aaron, walks in. They're from the middle of the wilderness. You know, they're unbathed. They probably have B.O. smell, the whole nine yards, right? They come into Pharaoh. This guy is, I mean, the Egyptians 
We think we're so technologically advanced. Man, these guys had it made. We still can't figure out how they did the pyramid thing. And these guys, they, they, Moses walks in. He says, my God, the God of, you know, the God who says I am that I am, says let, let my people go. I mean, just picture Pharaoh. Are you kidding me? Get, get out of here before I kick you out. And then, just like God does with the Philistines, God does with the Egyptians all by himself. It wasn't Moses bringing these plagues or these miracles. It was God. It was God moving. It was God working. And these plagues start coming down on the most powerful nation in the world, just wiping them out. And if you study that area, you'll notice at the beginning it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then the next plague, he would say, take, take the people. But then it'd say, he'd say, no, and say, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then after a while of Pharaoh hardening his heart, then if you study your Bible, it starts to say, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I can't tell you enough, church. Tend your heart. The Proverbs tells us, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Do you know you can do religious activity and your heart can be getting harder? You could be, quote unquote, serving the Lord, doing ministry, and your heart can be getting harder. The Lord says, tend to your heart. Tend to your heart. That's why we take communion regularly. I remember it was back when David Sarmiento lost his life. And I remember crying out to the Lord. My heart was broken. I remember when David came in on the coldest day of the year, him and his family, Sean and the kids came in and they brought these little kids and he was from Florida. Well, I'm from Florida. It's two degrees outside. Almost all the churches in the area closed that day. It was so cold. Now I'm a big football fan. So I thought to myself, they're going to play football today. We're going to have church and we are going to be inside with heaters. I mean, what are we doing, right? What are we complaining about? And I remember David gave his life to Christ. But after he lost his life, I remember my heart, oh, I had to like just do battle with my own heart because my heart was hardening. I was like, Lord, Lord. And I remember the Lord just said, come to the table, come to the bread, come to the wine, come to the cross. If your heart can get hard at the table of communion, because what happened at the cross makes Dagon falling in his hands and his head coming off look like child's play. You know, keep your heart soft, church, truly. We're almost done. Verse nine, let's move on. It says, so it was after they had carried it away. So now they're taking the, the ark away from that, that city, Ashdod, because they just want their hemorrhoids to go away, to be honest. Verse nine. So it was after they carried it away that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors, once again, the Hebrew tells us what it is, hemorrhoids, broke out on them. Now, listen, what city was this? We just found out, right? Anybody know what city this was? It was Gath. Can you say Gath? Yeah. Now, I don't want to ruin the rest of the book of 1 Samuel, but if you fast forward to chapter 17, young David, the, 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 the king that God would raise up, he ends up doing battle with a man from Gath. Anybody remember who that was? Goliath. Goliath. Remember Goliath? Big fella. Takes him down with a sling and a stone. Goliath was in Gath. It says here that these tumors came on both small and great. Now fast forward a little bit. David now, he's in the valley, and I don't want, we're going to teach that later. Chapter 17, two verses, verse 45 and verse 47 says, Then David said to the Philistine, to Goliath, he says, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Verse 47, Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give, he will give, he will give you into our hands. I almost read this with a different thing. I think David might have winked at Saul, I mean at Goliath at some point. It says, God doesn't fight with sword or spears. You know what I mean? Like I might be a little pipsqueak and I might not just have a slingshot and a rock in my hand. But do you remember 
God brought you to your knees, big fella. Do you remember? You remember? And it was just him. You think I'm not big enough to be used to the Lord. God doesn't even need me. It was just his presence in all of you goddamn roids, every one of you. Goliath, you remember. You know, if I was David, that would be in the Bible because I would have said that. I would have said, you come one step closer. Oh, wait till you see what happens. And I know it sounds funny, but really, this is what happened. You know, this is what happened. Goliath was in Gath. He was of Gath. They all got it. Goliath, it doesn't matter how big you are, how military trained you are. The God of the Bible will bring every man to his knees. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he, he doesn't just beat his enemies. He, he beats them, okay? <laughs> if you know what I mean. Verse 10. Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron. So th- these guys are playing hot potato with the ark of the covenant. Nobody wants this in their land. So it was as the ark of God came to Ekron that the Ekronites cried out saying, they have brought the ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. I mean, just think about this. Verse 11, so they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy here. Yeah, there was a plague of hemorrhoids (laughs) through the whole land. This is what the Bible tells us. I'm telling you right now, God has a sense of humor. I'm telling you. He could have done anything. They could have got pink eye or something, you know? Everybody could have had, a, had arthritis in their right knee. Nope, it's not what happened. Verse 12, and the men who did not die were stricken <laughs> with the tumor. See, I told you. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. You know, we'll close with this. Number five, if you're taking note, return your heart to Jesus. Return your heart to Jesus. Return your heart to Jesus. You know, I, I can't help but think... I can't help but think, what were the children of Israel doing at this time? What were they doing? I, you know, I, I think if we could look in at their little council meetings, or their, you know, the Israelite elders, those guys that thought, I'm this big guy for Jesus, right? I'm the one doing it. They're probably there pulling their hair out going, what are we going to do? They took our God. They're probably burning the Ark of the Covenant, you know. They probably melted the gold and turned it into, you know, some picture of Dagon. I mean, who knows what they said. But they were probably in this position of, like, they were defeated. We lost. It's over. It's all going to fall apart. And what's God doing? He's wiping them all out. All of them. He's got Goliath on his knees. He's got Dagon, no head, no arms. And they're literally, what are they doing? Let's get rid of this thing and send it back to the Israelites. And man did nothing. Nothing. Church, get it. If you're here and you think, man, this whole thing, it's it's all depends on me. I didn't spend time with the Lord today and I think the kingdom may not come and his will may not be done. It's it's not true. God's going to do it. He he wants you to come with him. He wants us. He definitely does not need us though. I'm certainly convinced, and you've heard me say this from the pulpit, I'm convinced, look at the chapter here, I'm convinced by him taking us with him, it slows it down. It hinders the process. I'm convinced. (laughs) Imagine the children of Israel were there in the ark. They would have never let this happen. They would have botched it, you know. They probably would have put stakes up to hold Dagon up because they would have been afraid. Well, if Dagon falls and his head comes off, then they're going to kill us all and our God can't protect us. Who knows? Meanwhile, God's going, would you stop it? (laughs) I am in authority over everything. I don't really need your help. But guys, get this. Don't let the enemy put you in that religious category. There's no power there. Stay in that real relationship. That's where it's at, guys. It's in a place, it's not based on right and wrong. Now, I'm not saying you and I shouldn't do the right thing and seek to obey the Lord. 
But the, but the higher plane of the Christian life is not to seek to obey the Lord. The higher plane of the Christian life is to seek to know the Lord, to walk with him. This is the deal. As you get to know Jesus, you'll, you'll fall in love with him. You'll like him a lot. Like, I like Jesus more than I liked the sin of this world that I lived in. I like Jesus better. He's won me over. It's not like, oh, 50-50, Man, Jesus just gets a little better because I read that devotional today. He's better, guys. He's better. He's more powerful. Jesus is the right master, church. He's the right master. And it's amazing here, and we'll close with this. They knew, the Philistines knew and they experienced the power and the fear of God, but they were still not willing in their hearts to submit their lives to him. Romans chapter 10 you know, Romans 10 tells us that it's with the mouth that we confess that Jesus is Lord, and it's with the heart we believe. It's with the heart. You know, salvation is activated when we confess and we say, you know what, Jesus, you're not just a great, you know, teacher, but you're God. And salvation happens when we say that, we believe that with our minds and with our hearts, we say, I want to follow you. We, we submit. We humble our hearts and we say, Lord, I want you. There's power there. Thankfully, I don't think anybody else in the Bible gets hemorrhoids ever. So, you know, God chooses some other judgments and discipline. But listen, tonight, whatever you're going through, wherever you're at, um, I can't encourage you enough. Don't just focus on your sin. If somebody gives you some plan or some program, how to get free, and it's about focusing on sin and learning the strategy of your sin and the problems of your sin, and you, the reason why you sin is because when you were three years old, you know, this happened to you and all this stuff. I don't know. I've never seen anyone made well that way. What I would say and what we see tonight, focus, get to know Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look at him. Know him. Keep your eyes on him. Listen, your sin, <laughs> it's your sin. But let Jesus, and what Jesus will do is he'll come in, like the woman who had the flow of blood, he'll, he'll start dealing with your sin. You keep your eyes on him. He, he's able to do that. This next week, guys, just bring in the Ark of the Covenant to your life, the presence of God. Be in the word, prayer. You're here tonight. You're gonna be blessed because of it. The Lord's got you. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm gonna close in prayer.